Ladies and gentlemen, my first, my first encounter with Brian Sewell was in February 2000, when he agreed to be interviewed for my book, Dialogues, published by Quartet later that year. I was deeply impressed by his command of the English language. He used words elegantly weaved to give precision to the articulation of his thoughts, and his answers had a depth that I had rarely experienced when interviewing others. It was a formidable experience, the way he parried and responded to the question I put to him, which has undoubtedly left its impact on me in the years that followed. Therefore, I was quite prepared last year when I read in the Evening Standard in an interview with him conducted by my old friend Sebastian Shakespeare that his manuscript for a book of memoirs had been passed over by a leading publisher. Confident that anything written by Brian was bound to be worth looking at, I telephoned him and asked whether I could be considered as his potential publisher. He hesitated, but eventually gave way and sent me the manuscript. I read it over a weekend and was entranced. The reading public, as well as the critics, agreed with me and the book met with the success it truly deserved. Brian, besides being a great art critic and commentator known for his forthright views, has now established himself as a master of the candid memoir. <laughs> he comes up with the sort of truth that some of us may secretly contemplate but would never dare, dare to write down. He seems to leave no stone unturned, but nevertheless, as usually happens with the text of this caliber, I'm always intrigued to discover more. Although there are many questions he has apparently answered, Others always arrive as, as a result, and perhaps even more revelation will emerge to be expanded on if we can draw back the veil. So this is my golden opportunity, and it is one which I am poised to take with great grace. Now we can begin with the questions. <laughs> Apart from yourself, one of the people I, I have interviewed who has bowled me over with his eloquence and elegant phrasing of language was the American writer Edmund White. His sheer, unadulterated honesty in talking about his father's dark relationship with his daughter, i.e. Edmund's sister, was the ultimate in soul-bearing that I have ever encountered. To me, the similarity between the two of you is in many respects astonishing. Do you recognize any common ground between your two characters? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, when I decided to write this um, wretched book, after 20 years of persuasion from one particular friend and many others, uh, I thought that at the age of 80 or so, one should hold nothing back. If, if, if somebody else's life is to be of any use to a wide readership, then it has to tell the whole truth. Absolutely the whole truth. You hold nothing back. Because every, every kind of experience, whether it's good or bad, um, it's part of your, your growing, your developing. It's part of the person you become. And so uh, I, I once, for example, spent six months in the care of a psychiatrist called Dr. Limentani. Um, and I simply didn't understand the, the processes of, of uh, analysis. Um, I've forgotten whether he was Jungian or Freudian or what. It doesn't really matter. Whatever, whatever his processes were, they didn't suit me. Um, and after six months or so, I, I gave up in, in broke it short. Um, impatient with, with the folly, impatient with myself for having undertaken this, impatient with Limentani for behaving the way he did, 
which was to sit with his fingertips together in total silence and never give me a leg up, as it were. He wanted me to confess things, but he never gave me the opening. And it was like an episode from We Clo. Um, nothing happened. And, and for me, therefore, and I don't know whether it is it, it, with any other writer, it is the absolute truth as you know it. It cannot be the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It can only be the truth as you know it, but it has to be the whole truth. So things about which I had been, shall we say, sheepish, um, like my sexuality, are... Uh, well, you know, if it's going to be useful to other people who are puzzled, um, disconcerted by their homosexuality, perhaps my example might be useful. Well, I'm going to come to that. The, the, the second, the late Auburn War, my dearest friend, was in real life a kind and generous individual who defended the people closest to him with his undying loyalty. But once he got a bee in his bonnet about someone, he'll hound him mercilessly in print until doomsday. Do you think you might harbor a similar inclination? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. I mean, I've been perfectly fair to, to Tracy Ehrman. Uh, <laughs> I have been judicious in my close attention to Damien Hurst. Uh, I have tried very hard with Grayson Perry. Um, so, I, no, it, and, and, you know, I, as a critic with, a, with uh, what was once a weekly column, and now seems to be much more uh, infrequent, um, you have to respond to things that are there. It is no use saying to my editor, well, I wrote about her last year, I don't want to do it again. The paper requires a column on an exhibition because Tracy Emin is a personality, a celebrity, a, a something or other that everybody wants to hear about. So I have to do it. Sometimes it's not a campaign. It is merely... It, and if she ever did anything that was worth tuppence, I would say so. <laughs> I once asked Auburn uh, why he attacks Grey Gowry mercilessly. Oh, I can understand that. <laughs> and then I said to him, well, you know, what is it that you, you've got against Grey Gowry? Well, he said, it's a long story. When we were in Oxford, he pinched my girlfriend. So, so, so that was the reason. Well, nobody ever pinched my girlfriend. <laughs> um, so, no, I, I think the... the the thing that he should have been attacking was the way we run our society. If you want somebody to head something, you look for the nearest lord, or you look for the nearest eminence of some kind or other. It doesn't matter whether he's got any qualifications to run the Arts Council, um, he's the right sort of bloke. So he gets the job. And it will happen again. The Arts Council is again up for grabs. It will, it will not go to the best man for the job, or the best woman for that matter. It will go to whoever is the favorite amongst the candidates. And the favorite will be the favorite of Boris Johnson. Do I mean Boris? Yes, I do mean Boris Johnson. Um, and, and imagine Boris Johnson influencing the arts. <laughs> What is the point of that? But that is the way we run things in, the, in our society. We are bonkers. You strike me as a person with nothing to fear, nothing to hide, unlike others who manipulate their life to suit their particular image. You being so forthright is to my mind an admirable quality, notwithstanding the danger it sometimes brings. Would you change your attitude if you were to start life again from scratch? If I were a clever man in that particular... Sure. No, no, no. Clever in the sense, the pejorative yeah. sense. Uh, I might. But, but I have many things to thank my mother for. Uh, and one of them, and perhaps the most important, is that I was taught always to tell the truth. Never deny that you've done something when you've done it. Tell the truth. 
the truth. The truth simplifies matters. You don't then have to go on lying about it. You don't have to invent fabrics and structures which protect you from the revelation that you were telling fibs. No, tell the truth straight away, get it over and done with. Um, and that has, that has always been my principle. And, and it was instilled in me at so early an age that I cannot remember the instilling. But it stays with me. It's it is the best way. I, when, you, when you invent something, you forget what you invented in the last time you, you told the story. Hmm. Then you get caught. You obviously have the experience. <laughs> no. when, I, when I was reading your manuscript, one of the first things to strike me about its many qualities was that it had entertainment value. Yet it evidently frightened off at least one mainstream publisher. Sometimes we get the impression of a sort of timidity being endemic in the corporate publishing scene today, with a nervousness in taking decisions, especially when it comes to a book that doesn't slot neatly into preordained tram lines. Why do you think there seems to be this failure of imagination? Oh, I think if you're running a big firm, you have to be successful. You have shareholders and other, other influences begin to play. And the manuscript, I thought you were going to say it was beautifully typed. <laughs> as, it, as it was by my standards. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, the, the, the thing went to publishers. Uh, Bloomsbury and... Oh, I can't remember what the other one was, but pretty big. Uh, and they, they wrote letters to my agent, which were pretty well identical. It could have come from the same draft. And their conclusion was that it would be of interest only to about a thousand people, and only people who were interested in the art market of long, long ago. Um, and so it would have no readership. But it's very funny, Brian, because um, Quartet is an independent publisher, we're not very rich. But during the 1980s and the early 1990s, all the big agents used to go to the conglomerate because they wanted large advances, and we couldn't afford to give any advances, hardly any, thousand or two thousand pounds. When they couldn't find anybody to publish the book, then they came to Quartet, obviously. They said it's better for the book to be published. Most of the books, that every other publisher rejected were our best sellers. Well, that doesn't surprise me, but, but there we are. You know, that, that's the way things happen. The artist Derek Hill, who oh. we both knew well, and who led an eventful and well-connected life, was once famously advised by the publisher Hamish Hamilton to ditch the dirt when it came to writing his memoirs. But Derek could never bring himself to set down what he felt were indiscretion and so remained a source of frustration to publishers and editors. What do you feel has freed you up from such barriers of inhibition? I'm surprised to hear that of, of Derek because Derek was always telling um, stories. I mean, he was a... He, he was, was a raconteur. He, he was not a raconteur, he was a gossip. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th I think Derek's problem was that he was also a painter and not a writer. Yeah. So he had great difficulty in putting things down. Talking to you over lunch was his, his way of writing his autobiography. And what he really needed was an amanuensis, a scribe, some hovering figure always to write down the story. And the stories changed slightly because he could never remember that he told them to you. So they got different glosses. And occasionally they were told about entirely different people. <laughs> so, um, but what was the question? No, the question, <laughs> what freed you from daily vision that he seems to have had? Age. <laughs> Age. At 80, you don't care. Yeah, I'm... You're 82, yeah. you don't care. I mean, you are 80, pause. Um, so, have you seen her anyway? The late Jock Murray repeated this said that if Derek Hill wrote the book, it would only be published by John Murray Limited over his dead body. 
because Derek will always be more troubled than his work. When Portet published Grey Gallery's study of his work, dealing with Derek was certainly a nightmare. One could become very fond of him because of his tremendous charm, but at the same time feet totally exasperated, especially by his overweening snobbery. Once when he was in our, uh, our guest in France, I returned early to London because I could take no more of it, and the girls at Portet loathed him for the way he treated them as minions. Did he show you this ugly side of himself? I knew Derek from uh, the mid-60s onwards, um, and I did not much care for him because he was uh, always dropping names and always staying with people like you and, and, and telling other people like me how grand his life was and so on. But again, Derek in old age was, was a much sweeter, gentler figure. And although he was still an old gossip, he was much easier to manage. You see, the problem with him when he came to stay with us in France he would give me every morning a list of what I should buy from the market. So I would go and buy from the market what he wanted. And then we would have breakfast. And then as soon as I sat down at the table, he would say to me, can I have another coffee? So I'd have to get up. And when I got up, as soon as I sat down, can I have yogurt now? In the end, he drove me insane. I said to him, listen, if you think you're a prima donna, I'm twice the prima donna you are, so stop it. And of course, you see, he couldn't stop it because he he's used to, he used to say that he's a friend of the Queen Mother of, of Prince Charles, and he, he considered himself royalty, and that's why he behaved in this manner. Well, you should have bought a larger coffee pot. <laughs> so. You came to feel that Derek Hill was a seriously undervalued artist. Why are we talking about Derek Hill and not me? <laughs> We're going to talk about you anyway. <laughs> we are now living in a time of so-called postmodernism, whatever that may be, when any style goes. But do you have a sense that there are other artists today producing art of quality in what some may think of as antique or reactionary style who are similarly underrated? There are a large number of painters and sculptors up and down the country, not just in metropolitan London, who are at this stage competent painters who are making a living and struggling a bit. Uh, they manage largely by painting the paintings that sell. What every painter needs is a thousand other people who are going to put their hands in their pockets and write a check. Without a dealer, without the exposure, they never get that patronage. And the great failing of the Arts Council and the British Council and the Tate is that they make no effort whatever to support these painters. Their support what is already supported. Damien Hirst, by the time he was 26, had had a hundred exhibitions, a hundred. And they had been achieved largely through the Arts Council and the British Council and the Tate. And so that amount of support continues to go where, where is the Damien Hirst exhibition for the Olympics? It's in the Tate again. It, it goes on and on and on. They'd never say, right, we've set you on your feet, now make your own way. And so he is still getting this public support, which means support out of our pockets. Well, my belief is, is overwhelming that the Arts Council in particular should devise mechanisms for showing other painters, because nothing makes a painter develop more than exposure. Freud started with those dinky little pictures, which are very beautiful, but they would never have made an impact if he had not had dealer support. 
And of course, in 1951, he was taken up by the Festival of Britain. He was little more than a boy. It, it, almost immediately afterwards, he was sent off to Venice with Biennale. Fine, that is what makes a painter expand. He, he, he develops to fill the ambitions of the supporting bodies. And so those bodies have to drop them. Once they've established them, pick up other people. Don't let them languish. And there, there are, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that I could, within looking at my address book, within an hour, find you a hundred painters who are worth a second look. But they will never get that second look because they don't appeal to the narrow orthodoxy of the combined forces of the arts and British councils and the various states. And it is a narrow orthodoxy and it's the, it is an orthodoxy in the sense that they all abide by it. They never look to either side. They never open the box in which they live. The last time we met like this, we had just said farewell with some relief to the 20th century and were looking forward to living in the new dawn of the 21st century. You may have been, I certainly wasn't. <laughs> 2000, the last time we met when I interviewed you in the year 2000. I, think I, I, I thought the 20th century was bad enough. What if possible indication was that the 21st would be any better? But what I'm saying, any optimism that was around at the time has begun to look quite misplaced. Do you sometimes feel we are seeing a rerun of the 20th century, only worse? Well, I'm not sure that it's a rerun because I'm old enough to remember the streets of London without, you know, with two parked cars. And the skies with, with nothing but German bombers and Spitfires in them, rather than the, 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 the heavyweight machines that constantly go over my house now, probably go over here too. Um, no, it, 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 it is not an improvement and we can't... All, all you can say about the 21st century is that so far it is a good deal worse than the tag end of the 20th century. And it doesn't look as though it's going to get any better. Go back to the 1930s, as I think the politicians should be now, and seeing what, what, what happened then. It may have gone wrong for different reasons, but my recollection of the 30s is that almost everybody was living in some, if not in downright poverty, certainly in their dowdy circumstances. And that's what we're destined for. People will not be able to paint their houses. This kind of this exquisite um, area of, of, of Primrose Hill will look rather shabby in five years' time. I'm going to ask you now a political question. In the year 2000, looking at the political scene, you placed Tony Blair among the politicians in both main parties that you found ludicrous and repellent, but said there was one serious politician in the Labour camp, and that was Gordon Brown. Would you still maintain this, bearing in mind the utter failure of his term as Prime Minister and the fact that as Chancellor of the Exchequer, his job was even worse when he thought Britain gold reserve for peanuts when he didn't have to? Those whom the gods love, they first make mad. Um, and and uh, see, so they did. No, I, I, I think there was a change in, in Gordon Brown. Uh, and it was brought about by the frustrations of living next door to Tony Blair. The, the, if there really was an undertaking between the two, that you have it first and I have it second, uh, then he was very badly treated by Blair. Apart from that... In the first uh, instance, you mean, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, one or other of them had to yeah. be, yes. But, uh, you know, I'm the only, the only great, decent... Let me put it that way, the only decent politician on the Labour Party side that we've had in recent years is, is, is the sadly long-retired um, other Tony, Tony Benn. Now, there is a wise man. I like Tony Benn. I once interviewed him, and I thought he was wonderful. Yes, but he was a decent man. Yeah. He could see through the shallowness of other politicians. I'm sure he had no respect for Tony Blair either. 
Once we're on the subject of politicians, who would you name a serious politician in the duration of our current phase of coalition politics? I don't think there is one. I think, I think, I think it's an extraordinary thing. We have 70, 70 million people in this country, and the best we can throw up as leaders are the people who are running the Conservative, the Labour, and the Liberal parties. Just look at them. These, these, these running the country, these, these inexperienced boys, these, they have never done anything, they've never been anywhere, they've never suffered anything, they've never experienced anything deeply unpleasant. They have no experience of what ordinary life is like, and they're running the country. It makes no sense. No, it doesn't. It's true. Turning to your personal background. Oh dear. You hint that your mother may have led a frisky sort of life in her younger years and have been almost a courtesan figure with certain artistic or rapid circles because you can't otherwise account for how she got by on a very limited income or come to have such a wide circle of apparently unlikely contacts. This is perhaps an unconventional view to have of one's mother been an amalgam of love and hatred occurring simultaneously. Would it be possible for you to enlighten us further on this very subject? I don't think there was any hatred. Uh, there, 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 there was a hint of it at times, yet there was love. It was an amalgam of both. Well, in that case, I haven't written a very good book. <laughs> um, no, I mean, my, my mother was a... One might hate her in the sense that she has done that extraordinary Freudian thing of being the dominant female with, with a subservient male. You know, Mother-son relationships are very fraught, as some of you will know. Um, my, no, I, my mother certainly had a frisky um, time in the 20s. And uh, whenever the question of drugs came up in much more recent decades, um, she, she would quite suddenly say, I don't know what all the fuss is about. We were, we were all um, snorting coke when I was a girl. And, so, uh, and I think she was. And I, think she, I think she had a, a really wonderful life in the 20s. She was, she was beyond pretty. She was clearly a very beautiful girl, and she didn't lose her looks as she approached 30. So, uh, I don't know. I, and I remember when, when, I was, um, when I was doing my national service, and I, I was turned into a subaltern from a squaddy, we were given uh, a, um, a couple of weeks' leave, and my mother um, had celebrated this for me by buying tickets to fly to Paris and spend a week there. Uh, and this was a time when you didn't just buy tickets for an aeroplane. So that was thrilling enough. And then we got to Paris, and we stayed in the very hotel in which she had lived for years when she was there in the late 20s. And the same people were there. And, and we went all over Paris. We went to Versailles, the Louvre, and Malmaison, and so on. And it was like having a big sister. It wasn't a bit like having a mother. And my mother remained a sort of big sister until much later. Any question of, of a real emotional difficulty came after the death of my, my stepfather, when I had to replace him, as it were. Um, and, and she was getting old, and, and well, you know, mothers do get old and difficult. <laughs> the identity of your father was unknown to you for many years, but you eventually discovered he was the composer and musicologist Peter Warlock, born as Philip Hazeltine, who committed suicide in 1930 and had been a noted womanizer. Your mother kept your paternity as a secret, but she fostered musical ambitions for you. Though interestingly, you say you cannot listen to any of Warlock's music. Do you think she had an idea that she might build on the musical genes, so to speak? 
Oh, I, I, I imagine so, yes. She, she, this may have been some kind of misguided loyalty to uh, my father, but misguided it was. I, most of his music is that sort of dreadful English, light tenor stuff, sort of <laughs> vaguely howling and yowling, you know. But you didn't like any of his music, really, when you think about it. No, no, no. I have no reason to like it. It, it, it certainly ain't Schubert. <laughs> I suspect it might be a trial to sit next to you at the concert. As you say, you find music emotionally overwhelming. Which composer sets your feeling and what, of, what sort of music leaves you cold? Well, I, I, I think... I had a wonderful schoolmistress in my first year at school, or Irene Johnson, who s sort of abandoned any attempt to, to stick to the regulations, as it were, um, and imported a piano, and her sister, who sang Schubert. And 11-year-old boys, a class of 11-year-old boys, with a woman lustily singing Schubert songs. It was a wonderful experience. And it has never gone away. I, I, still, I still hear Schubert songs uh, with the same excitement and enthusiasm. The voices change, but the music doesn't. Um, and, you know, re but then I go from him to Wagner to Richard Strauss to Mozart and so on. I don't, I don't like early music. Um, it all, it, no, I'm, it, I'm, it leaves me cold. And I certainly don't like anything after um, Risen Cavalier. But if you had to choose one, would you choose Richard Wagner? As overwhelming, if you like. Oh, that's, that's a desert island question. And I don't, I don't really, I don't really know. It would have to be the human voice, whatever it was. The orchestras are all very well, but the, I don't know, in the, you're in the opera and, and there is this single figure on the other side of the orchestra lobbing a sound at you over the orchestra. We have that web of sound in front of her and there she is and over it comes and it's wonderful. Um, and that's what I would need. So something from Wagner would do. <laughs> you take a very positive view of your national service, feeling that the war was as important a stage in your education as anything else. But wasn't it as much a survival course as anything in your, in your school days, in your school days? Oh, I, I liken my national service to to um, sort of going in to, like a teapot with a spout and a lid and a handle and coming out after two years without a lid and a spout and a handle. You, you get all your odd things knocked off. It, it, it's a very egalitarian society. You couldn't have it now. It was, it was wonderful because it took every 18-year-old boy out of the employment or unemployment pool. It took boys who had no education, no inclination ever to do a day's work, and gave them a trade. It was very difficult to come out of the army not improved by it in a very practical way. You might become an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, a great driver. You might be able to drive absolutely anything when you came out of the army. Um, and, and, and there was a skill which all these 18 to 20 year olds would not have had. And so they came out of the army, they had something to offer an employer, as well as the disciplines that they had learned. And you, the, the, the simplest way of describing national service is that you put 21 boys in a room and call it a platoon. And somehow or other, those 21 boys have to learn to live together. And the army is competitive, and platoons are made to compete, to compete against each other. And the strength of a platoon is only as good as its weakest member. 
So if you have one weak member, your 20 other boys have to carry him. And they learn to do so. And this is the perfect image of the welfare state. So my generation understood what the welfare state was about. And it wasn't about benefits. It was about a very much more intelligent kind of support. And the great failure of our education system, which lies, I think, behind everything that is wrong with this country, is that it doesn't understand how bad it is. And it offers no substitute whatever for the life of the squaddy in a platoon all those years ago. After national service, you returned to the Courtauld Institute, where you had previously studied with a, with a matured sense of purpose towards becoming an art historian, but also with the longer-term notion of being a priest. Would you describe this latter ambition as being a vocation, or did it have more, did it have more attraction as a possible solution to what you saw as the problem of being homosexual? Oh, I think it was both those things. It was a very attractive proposition. Um, and it's, it's, very easy, um, it's very easy to convince yourself that you have a vocation. And the people in authority over you are also very willing to convince you that you have a vocation. They never deny it, they never question it, they never sort of suggest that this may be a delusion. And so you... you you go on with it. And of course I had, I had the problem of my, uh, my lurking homosexuality. I had, I had at the age of 18 uh, rather given up sex. Not a good time to give up sex, but you know. Um, I, I, my last year at school, it was a resolution. This I have to stop doing. Uh, and so for the best part of 10 years, I was was deluded into this idea that I, I could become a priest and that becoming a priest would settle that problem and that I'd be perfect and I'm interested in theology and I have profound respect for people who still have a religion but I'm afraid mine has rather gone away from me. Your time at the court hall was during your years of celibacy if body if not in mind and it was then that you came to know Anthony Blunt as a tutor, when the whole shadow side of his life was quite unknown. Your friendship with him was based on respect for the integrity of his scholarship and his capabilities that made the court hall a world leader in the teaching of art history. I know you will be expanding on your relations in, with Blunt in your next volume, which will appear in the autumn. And the public is already... That's hungry. advertising. Sorry? That's advertising. <laughs> it's a bit of advertising. Yes. <laughs> we're allowed it. No, we're not. <laughs> no, you're, no, 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 don't. So shall I skip that? Yes. Okay, I'll skip it. I wanted to say, is there anything more you would like to say at this stage, or leave it till the book gets published? <laughs> you're not going to let go, are you? Um, no, only, only that Anthony, um, when, when, I, uh, when I took finals, and we have that awful thing of Viva with you know, Gombrich and Ettlinger and Blunt and Wilder sitting on the other side of a table shooting questions at you, and you think, oh, <laughs> this is awful. Um, and then five minutes later, Anthony is saying, you have to do research. You have to go for a PhD then that was, that was a hugely encouraging thing. And then, of course, he, he did everything he possibly could. I had no money, so I couldn't do it immediately. Uh, and in the end, I couldn't do it at all. Um, though I nurtured the idea for ages. But um, no, actually, it was huge support to me. There was nothing, um, there was affection. But there was nothing physical in that affection, nothing at all. It never occurred to either of us. I mean, Anthony preferred window cleaners, and I was never one of those. <laughs> the ending of your phase of celibacy came about quite suddenly. 
and dramatically with a sort of reaction and challenge to the deity. But to rebel against God, you presumably have to believe in his existence. How do you feel about God today? Oh, I think this is a very indiscreet question. But if you must have an answer, then it is that every time I, every time I hear on the news of a flood in America or a tsunami in the Southeast Asia or an earthquake in the poorest parts of Pakistan um, or the demolition of churches by earthquakes in Italy, which seems rather wry, um, I, just, I just can't see... Um, I can't see anything but a perverse old graybeard, if he really exists. Actually, if God invented us, I cannot, I cannot for the life of me um, understand why he, why he made sex so pleasurable. <laughs> if he didn't want us all to be thoroughly immoral, Sexually, it would, it why did made it make it painful? Yes, make it difficult. <laughs> no. <laughs> As your celibacy ended, you swiftly mastered the street techniques of the homosexual. Oh, I, 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 I don't think this audience wants to know about. That. No, 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 no. Let me finish it first. You can do for quick encounters and gratification, involving perhaps two or three encounters in one afternoon. Oh, more than that. More than that. <laughs> that, no, why this question? I'll tell you why. That promiscuous side of a homosexual lifestyle is one that leaves us heterosexuals gasping for breath. Is that you're, something... You're gasping with envy. Yeah, with envy and breath. The, the energy. Is there something in the gay makeup or genes that propels it into achieving such phenomenal ecstatic heights driven by energy levels that seem to know no bounds. I don't know. You have to ask somebody who knows about these things. I mean, I'm, I'm only the, the victim or the pra practitioner or whatever you like to call it. But, you know, sex, sex was on... Sex became available at every bus stop, in every underground train, on every escalator, in every back alley. It, 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 and it, it, you know, one did the most extraordinarily rash things. I didn't actually do it standing up in a canoe, but I'm sure I would have the opportunity of risen. No, my question is the level of energy that homosexuals have. I mean, we'd be totally knackered if we did the same. No, no, no. You wouldn't. You just didn't do it well, often I enough. I would be dead. <laughs> well, talk to Casanova. Yeah, that's, that's in fiction, really. I'm sure that there are many Casanovas in the audience. <laughs> okay, we'll skip that. Looking back at this period in your life, would you say that art and sex were dominating factors in everything you did? And is there any tangible correlation between the two? I suppose the short answer is yes. And I think there is a correlation because it's impossible, let me put it this way, I think it was probably impossible for Michelangelo to carve the great David without having an erection. I think, I think we'll stop at the erection. <laughs> right. We were all raised on the idea that progress in all things... Oh, I thought we were stopping the, the interview. Sorry? You're going on with the interview. Yeah, of course I'm going on. Oh, all right. Yes, <laughs> go on. We were all raised on the idea that progress in all things, from lifestyle to technology, was the key to solving the human dilemma. Have we been deluding ourselves, really? Well, of course we're deluding ourselves. Progress is, progress is, is one of those shibboleths that uh, people uh, feel they have to allowed to happen. We mustn't stay in the, uh, stand in the way of progress. Well, of course you should. And it seems to me that uh, you can see how silly we are now when we are delighted today because the rate of inflation has dropped 2.8 or something of the kind from 3.5 or whatever. And this is, 
Um, let me remind you all that 2.8 is still nearly 3%, and that 3% on 3%, year after year after year, over a decade, means that the money under your pillow or in your bank, and there ain't much difference between the two, uh, is going to be reduced by about a third. And that's how we run our economy. We run an economy on production. Oh, we've got to increase production, everybody's saying. Every single politician all over Europe is saying, let's increase production. But they're also saying, let's reduce pollution. Let's reduce the damage that we do to the earth. Well, I can tell you how you reduce the damage you do to the earth, and that is you, s you stop making so many motor cars. You make a motor car that lasts for 50 years, and we're all content with it. We don't change because Mercedes have made a more fashionable shape or drawn a line along something. Have to have it. Three. Your own Mercedes is only three years old. It's done 30,000 miles. It's virtually unused. And you go out and buy another. I don't know what you've got. But, but, In the you know. 1950s. But, but, but that's yeah, what's wrong with society. That's where we are mad. We have politicians and economists who drive us to do things that we do not need to do. It would be much better if we all sat down and cultivated our gardens. In the 1950s, in his persona as a critic, Wyndham Lewis wrote a polemic called The Demon of Progress in the Arts. It was an attack on the idea of newness for newness sake, and he pen personified the great god progress as a very jealous god indeed. He saw the middleman, the artist agent and dealer as being a central element in fostering this ethos. Do your own contact with the art world in the past half century bear this out. Oh, that's perfectly true. You've got a ridiculous situation where um, the dealers uh, push and push and the institutions push and push. They elevate people into a, a level of importance that was inconceivable even 20 years ago, let alone in previous generations. And so you have young-ish men like Peter Doig who have to charge six million pounds for painting. They have to charge it. It's because it, that is where the level of their pricing is. No picture by Peter Doig is worth six million or even 600,000 or even 6,000. When you look at what, what, what happened with the, the Damien Hurst sale at Sotheby's, 111 million or something like that, no. Every bank is buying pictures. They're all collecting the same thing. Because they think it's a good investment. <coughs> yes, they think it's a good investment, and then the painters and the sculptors begin to make the duplicates so that they can have the same thing, which is ridiculous. And, and if you wander around Germany, where there are more contemporary art museums than, than anywhere else in Europe, you find exactly the same thing over and over and over again. You've seen it all before. There is absolutely no point in going to the, the, the Varash Richards in, in Cologne. You've seen it. It's here. You've seen it in the, in the Tate. You go to Paris, you will see it in the, in, in, in the Bobo. And so it's everywhere. The picture you draw of the auctioneer's Christie's after joining them in the 1950s is a startling one of a gentlemanly facade concealing a situation rife with minor corruption, skimmed scholarship, slab dash, ambition, and fossilized attitudes. Coping with this was nevertheless a continuation of your own education. Taking the longer view, how do you value the experience today? Oh, I think working for Christie's for 10 years was, was absolutely a wonderful education. Hundreds of pictures went through my hands every week. You can't help but learn. And you learn and learn and learn. And, and, and you, know, you know more than any museum official. Once errors go into print, it can be very difficult to establish correction. Do you think there is any legacy from those days of false attribution still extant? Or does time continue the sifting process as the decades pass? There were quite a lot of misprints in my book. 
Um, oh, yeah, no, I think, I think people are now tough enough to question simply because the director of Christie's insisted on, on, on my cataloging a picture as by Rubens in 1960 doesn't mean that it is still called Rubens because there are dispassionate, uninvolved scholars who have looked at it since and who said that can't possibly be. I don't care what it said in the Christie's catalogue. We've moved on. So, you know, we're, we're, we're in, in the history of our tour, we're always moving on. But would you say, Brian, would you say reassuringly that the world of the auction room is today very different from the one you entered? Oh, yes, absolutely. And they, 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 take, they take almost too much care because they won't take a risk. So if you have a picture on which nobody agrees, but um, you, the auctioneer, feel that it is by, let's say, Rubens again, um, you dare not catalogue it as by Rubens because you cannot get anyone to agree with you. So you call it something else. Uh, by the same token, you have a situation where if a picture by Raphael, there was a portrait at Christie's some two or three years ago, which made, I think, the nonsense price of 16 million. Uh, 16 million is not enough for a Raphael portrait. On the other hand, it's much too much for a dud. But that was a picture which art historian after art historian had accepted as by Raphael. And the auctioneer couldn't possibly express his doubt. He might privately express it, but he couldn't catalogue it expressing his own doubt. So it, it's... Um, and you do have situations where you have experts uh, in... Uh, Utrillo, for example, has, has um, had an expert called Petridis who published everything painted by Utrillo, so he said. And that is still the Bible. That is still, but everybody knows that Petridis was a mercenary crook and that half the pictures in the catalogue resume are not by him. But nobody, nobody says anything because he's still regarded as the great expert. In judging the integrity of a painting, there seems to be a sort of alchemy at work involving not only well-informed scholarship but also subliminal instinct so that you cannot separate the one from the other. Is this element of sub subjectivity invariably a part of the process? I think it's, it's, it's something that initiates the process. Um, you go into a room and you see something and your stomach knots. It's a very physical thing. And, and, and you, you feel, feel it. it. Yes. You feel it. It's here. Uh, and from that point, you begin to work on it. Because your, your stomach, oddly enough, is the, the Geiger counter of quality where paintings are concerned. Um, you may not know what it is, but your stomach has told you that it's, it's wonderful. And that's when you begin to work as an art historian, um, clerically, you know, examining and comparing and digging up and so on. Your life as a critic with a prominent, widely read column in the Evening Standard, to which to express your views has helped to make you a somewhat hated figure in the eyes of much of the art community. Much more than somewhat. I, I, I wanted to tell you to dilute a bit. Is this out of jealousy, or is it because you so often unravel the hypocrisy and the machinations of the establishment? I don't think I've ever unraveled it. I've, made, I've exposed it. If I'd unraveled it, there might have been some change. But all I do is open a window on, on to what is wrong, and, and then other people come along and close it. So I get nowhere. But is there sort of an element of jealousy involved? No, I think there's an, an element of anger in that they can see the price of things diminishing. So it, it affects their pockets. One of the criticisms some would level against you is that you have a knee-jerk loathing of modern art. Not but true. But isn't this mm. a start oversimplification? Well, it's an oversimplification. There is no such knee-jerk reaction. It, 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 there is a problem. We are producing far too many artists for rather bad reasons. 
People want a degree, they can go and get a degree. A degree, for heaven's sake, in art. No, it's, a, it's, an, it's an unquantifiable, unmeasurable, indefinable. It's not an academic discipline. It isn't even a discipline of any kind. Painters don't have to paint, sculptors don't have to sculpt. People can say a photograph is a piece of sculpture, Gilbert and George do, so on. So there, there are no definitions. How, therefore, can there be degrees? 